This is a really fantastic group of speakers, incredibly distinguished, incredibly knowledgeable about, about these issues, and will provide us with um, some guidance as to what some of this discussion that we've had in the morning means uh, in terms of designing policies uh, towards um, these uh, unrecognized polities and, and the underlying conflicts uh, in them. So we're going to uh, proceed uh, in a slightly different order than what's listed on the schedule. We're going to start with His Excellency Ambassador Tumuri uh, Yakovishvili. Uh, and, and we welcome Ambassador Yakovishvili back. Uh, he has uh, spoken at Columbia uh, um, at least one other time that I know, possibly others too. Uh, I can't think of a more um, uh, qualified person uh, to give the Georgian perspective on these issues. Uh, prior to his position uh, as the Ambassador to the United States, uh, Ambassador Yakovishvili was the minister um, at the Georgian um, uh, State Minister for Reintegration in the Government of Georgia. He's dealt with these issues uh, for a number of years, and he was also uh, formulated uh, the most recent um, strategy for engagement um, with these territories. Um, Ambassador Yakubishvili also uh, has a distinguished career as a policy analyst and a researcher. He was, um, as you can see, a co-founder of um, an executive vice president of the Georgian Foundation for Strategic International Studies, um, known as the preeminent think tank on strategic issues in the Caucasus. Um, so, uh, Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours, and we uh, look forward to uh, your responses and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I still don't know in what capacity I'm invited here, the current one or my previous ones, but probably in my presentation and q and I'll be sort of switching in these three different uh, things, you know, the ambassador, former minister, and former think tanker. Um, uh, I was listening to very interesting panels, and I want to go, uh, sort of salute uh, the organizers of having this panel, uh, uh, this conference. Uh, of course, as many of you, I also disagree with the name. That I think that we should start now with disagreements and not rather than jokes. I was trained that you should joke before you speak, but now I think that I have to disagree with the rest of the panelists about the title. And obviously my disagreement is uh, no joke here, and I think that there is a difference between uh, non-recognized states, uh, frozen conflicts, and uh, realities on the ground, and realities that we are dealing. We have a very much recognized states, you know, very few countries recognize them as independence, and the rest of the world recognize them as uh, occupied territories. So why this distinction is very important? Because occupation is not only a, a just a funny term, but international lawyers will agree with me that it has a very concrete legalistic um, applications. Uh, in that sense, uh, our policy to persuade the recognition of occupation is not just uh, satisfying the ego of Georgians, those who live in Georgia or who are exiled from occupied parts of Georgia, but we fully understand the legal consequences of it. In that sense, I think that we will have a completely different picture that was painted by the previous speakers here. Second aspect I want to draw your attention is that it was, I think, Andreas de Tocqueville who said in his Democracy in America that um, politicians prefer useful to morale, and if you allow them, they will make morale useful. It's for politicians, not for the think tankers. And when I'm seeing here all sorts of the opinion polling and talks about how we should integrate into the international policy so-called de facto government, I think the moralistic issues should be somehow reflected there. We are talking about regions that both had an ethnic cleansing. Obviously, I'm now focused on Abkhazia and South Ossetia. 80% of the population of both entities are in exile. And I'm not talking only about Georgians, ethnic Georgians, or this weird, you know, the subdivision of Georgians, Georgians slash uh, Mingrelians, Mingrelians no slash Georgians. And what is that? 
I mean, it's completely unacceptable even for the uh, think tank kind of exercise. And we just cannot ignore that there are 30,000 Abkhaz in exile from Abkhazia. We just, I'm not talking about 250,000 Georgians. I'm not talking about how these Georgians who live now um, uh, on these territories are treated or mistreated will be the proper term to use. So while we have these intellectual exercises, we should not forget morals. Again, you are not the politicians. Uh, so that quiz should not be applicable to you. Then, um, this is actually the very unique um, conference that I mostly agree to all panelists, but in different level of agreement, obviously. There are things that are uh, in full agreement with what I think or the government of Georgia thinks, and there are things that I disagree. I think uh, this is not only the terminological issue, but it's also an issue of the truth. And that speaking about elected uh, Kokoiti, it's a, I think it's a bad joke. Because in reality, what we had, we had, and now I can speak about it loudly because um, enough time has passed, we had an agreement, uh, uh, Shevardnadze and Yeltsin had an agreement that you know, South Ossetia would be a first case of the resolution of the conflict and uh, as a test case, and it really moved in that direction, and there were some plans about federation and all of that, and there was a free movement, and free movement was allowed exactly for those reasons, and the moment the Georgians or the Georgian government refused to allow bombing Chechnya from the Georgian territories, you know, the previous so-called president of a, uh, South Ossetia was removed and Kokoriti was reinstalled. So it was not election. It was a brutal change of the course of the Russian Federation in that particular case for the very specific reason. And when we are talking about election today, basically you are telling me that Russia has a difficulty to control its proxies or something that they plan is not going well, and I have to feel sorry or I have to feel offended or I have to feel somehow about it? No, because heroes, as it was pa painted here, of uh, Ossetian conflicts, Tedev, by the way, who uh, ran away from Russia this morning, uh, who was behind this so-called candidate, this woman, uh, who was running there, and uh, Barankevich, so-called former defense minister. They were all trying to get access to one pot of money, and both of them, they had their own lobbies in the Russia whom they were you know, kicking back some incomes, and like corruptions that we are discussing on these territories are coming from the heaven. Like this money that is stolen and money that is misplaced is not coming from Russian Federation and is not you know, kicked back to Russian officials. I mean, let's be realistic what we are talking about and not have a kind of illusions about kinds of regimes and kinds of people and kinds of you know, realities we are facing on the ground. Soviet Union is not dead, it is very much dead. Soviet Empire is dead. The next is the Russian Empire who is dying. And a friend of mine who told me that you know, this KGB managed to destroy Soviet Union, now the same KGB is destroying Russian Federation. And yes, I agree in this case with Mr. Markedonov that Russia conducts the same policy in the Northern Caucasus as in occupied regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia because it seems that it's the same place. It's the same sphere of influence of Great Russia or whatever. And that's what's gonna you know, seriously undermine uh, Russia as a state itself. And the problem is that it's not Georgians are not controlling Abkhazia and South Ossetia because they are occupying forces there. Russia itself cannot control the Northern Caucasus because Russian constitution cannot be enforced in a big part of the Northern Caucasus. So these are the consequences of playing around the way they play. International actors, like somebody from the moon came and sort of triggered um, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia or Transnistria anything. We know very well who did it. And don't tell me that you are not aware that Russians were engaged there or uh, remain engaged. 
And uh, all these notions that uh, you know, there was local forces, of course, they are always local forces. How the other empires were you know, operating, the British Empire, what, they were you know, sending the expeditionary troops only themselves, or they had the local elites? They always had the local elites. So uh, as Svante uh, Cornell mentioned, I mean, there are a number of layers of these conflicts. That obviously, we cannot ignore any of them. But well, let's be realistic about all these layers and how much these layers independently act and how much they are intertwined. So nobody is saying that there are no separatist Abkhaz there or there are no separatist societies, but we have to be realistic about understanding that these separatists were very effectively, so far, used by the Russian government against the Georgian state. So now, yes, we do, we, we do have a multiple layer conflicts and I think it takes much more sophisticated approach to solve them than just saying that you know these are players or these are not players to ignore anybody there or uh, you know uh, pretend that it's only Russia or it's only separatists or something like that. It's much more complex, and I think that people in this panel understand this complexity and those who were previously speaking as well. So, um, is it is it inevitable that this kind of conflicts would happen? Probably not, but it's, uh, I think that there are a number of countries in European Union now who have a separatist problem, but none of them actually uh, you know, developed into full-fledged military confrontation. It was exactly the internal, external factor called the Russian Federation who triggered all of that. And uh, when we are talking about resolution and uh, of these conflicts, I think that resolution should be happening in number of parallel dimensions. And these parallel dimensions, I think, it's very well written by my former office, uh, Ministry of Reintegration, in the State Strategy for Reintegration. And here we have to understand several ingredients that are very important. Ingredient number one is that removing the Russian factor is not going to finally solve the conflict. You still have a population residing on occupied territories. You have to deal with that. But pretending that only dealing with people who are residing on occupied territories will lead to solution of the conflict will be a lunacy. I basically disagree with the one of the popular notion in academic community that this magnet theory that you will become so attractive that you know they'll change their mind and will come and stick to you gonna work. I mean it never worked in any places and I think solution there will be multi vectoral approach. One is the Georgian Russian relation. And in Georgian Russian relation one is very it's one thing is very important to underline that you don't deal with Russia alone. Whenever you deal with Russia alone, Russia has larger capacity, not only military but institutional. It has a larger megaphone. I was surprised that uh, what uh, Sergei Markedonov mentioned that Russians cannot articulate what they want. You have a Ketchum company hired for you, paying, and your money, your taxpayers' money is paid to them. Ask them to formulate your message. They had 11 persons working against Georgia during the war. Ketchum is the largest PR firm in the United States, so I don't think that you should have that kind of problem. Uh, probably the problem is the truth, not the articulation of position. Uh, dealing with Russian Federation is necessary, it's inevitable, it's uh, needed, and we are ready. Is it possible? I think yes. But one should be realistic about Russian Federation. Now, we had the long discussions how Georgia and Russian Federation can communicate and how they can interact. And obviously, any textbook can tell you that they, you should find a common ground and common interests. You know, the weird thing about Russia is that I can name you now three basic interests where we should cooperate. And obviously, one is Northern Caucasus, which is as much threat to Georgia as to Russia, probably more to Russia, but still is a threat to us, to our security, because we already had the Pankisi Gorge. We know what are the consequences of spillover. It is a north-south 
trade corridor. It is Sochi Olympics. Russia needs the Georgian infrastructure to build Sochi Olympics because there is a serious limitation of infra infrastructure to uh, import um, building materials. So I'm telling you so obvious areas of cooperation that anybody would say, yeah, of course. I mean, it's so obvious that these two countries should cooperate. And now look what Russia does in all three cases and how it fits any rationale or any patriotism on the Russian side. Nevertheless, that's a situation that we are dealing with. So probably the conventional wisdoms that you know you should find the common grounds and then cooperate is not working. And what is working is actually international uh, kind of institutions and international pressure. Here, here I disagree with you, Lincoln, because what worked was the WTO agreement. It was not the only Swiss mediation, obviously. It was EU very actively engaged in that. And it was United States very actively engaged in that. Okay? And it's the first time when people say, oh, Russia is not going to take its recognition. Of course it can. In the document that we reached with the Swiss proposal, there is nothing like independent Abkhazia or South Ossetia. And the trade regime in the entire Georgian-Russian border is unified, it's one regime. There are no separate regimes for Abkhazia, Tskhinivali region, South Ossetia, and uh, 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 the um, Larsic uh, uh, corridor. It's a one regime. So what I'm saying is that we have to cooperate with Russia, we have to find the, uh, you know, understanding, but the methodology is not to leaving Georgia and Russia in a one room and say, now you find the solutions, guys. It's not gonna work. And all these things like make sense to you is not making sense, unfortunately, for them. Uh, I, by the way, I found a fantastic book, which I would strongly recommend you to read. It's written by Georgian, who was uh, fighting Russia in 1921, and then fled and was fighting for Polish independence, and then he was fighting Nazis, and then he came to US and died here in 79 or 75, and he written, has written this book. It's called What Everybody Should Know About Russia. It's not only about Russia. It's a very, very interesting book uh, about foreign policy. And I'm just strongly recommending you to find this book and read it. Um, now, how to deal with, I mean, we can come up with fantastic language, uh, separatist regimes, pro proxy regimes, uh, you know, um, local governments, whatever we call it. Authorities in control. We call them authorities in control in our strategy. First of all, is it necessary to deal with them? Absolutely yes. How we should deal with them and what are the areas that we should deal with them? I think that areas are at least five. And it should be a humanocentric areas, not the political. It should be about education, healthcare, travel, uh, you know, trade, and uh, this kind of areas, you know? Because, again, these people will be rightly or wrongly minded. They are humans, and we should not forget that we are dealing with humans primarily, and then we are dealing with citizenships and political aspirations. So our strategy is based on humanocentric ideas, and we believe that engagement is possible, it's necessary, and it's inevitable. Uh, I remember a lot of people being very skeptical when we first started to come up with the idea of having the strategy. Then we, when we had the strategy, they were skeptical about how much we meant uh, uh, to have that strategy. And then about implementation of the strategy. And, you know, we were not ignoring the skeptics, but we were moving forward. And one of the biggest issues that we, are, um, uh, we were uh, you know, trying to handle was how these people travel. Who are they? Are they uh, Georgian citizens, but they don't have a Georgian passport? They do have a Russian passport. Are they completely Russian citizens? Our approach was that you should not treat them as a Russians or Russian citizens. You should treat them as something else. 
and we came uh, up with an idea of independent uh, you know, status neutral passports. You know how many people told me it's not possible, you Georgians don't mean it? Here is it. You are the first ones who see it. It's just freshly printed. It's a status neutral document that we produced and is already recognized by a number of states. And there are already a number of them issued. And people can travel with these kind of documents everywhere they want. And there is not even one single, you know, uh, coat of arm of anything that would indicate that, you know, that it's a Georgian passport or something like that. Only thing you can find is that country of code of state is a GEO, and it's a requirement of EU and it's a requirement of US for uh, readmission uh, point of view. Okay? We mean it. When we say that we have a strategy, we are going to implement it, we mean it. Can we implement strategy alone? No. We need you. And that sense, I agree in the most of the panelists who are advocating for greater engagement of the international community on these regions. I think that the international community can, should help government of Georgia in implementation of this strategy, should be with us in addressing needs of the population who are residing in occupied territories, should help us, in, like in the case of the WTO, to talk to Russian Federation, and you will see that things will start moving. How long it will take, I don't know. But it's an irreversible process. It's a necessary process. And I do believe that there is a no military solution to these problems. But I do believe that there are solutions and we have to be fair toward the population who are residing there. And again, not inflating importance of uh, the proxy regimes, but not being excessively sort of entertained by the processes that are happening there because it's not about you or us, it's about money that they will be splitting among themselves. Um, I'm talking too much, I know. Uh, last thing I wanted to say in my presentation is that uh, there are so many theories about conflict resolution. And some people even believe that conflicts cannot be resolved, they can be managed. Uh, I belong to that camp that believes that the solutions can come. And solutions cannot be artificial. In that sense, there is no United States who can bring I don't know, Armenians and Turks together say now, you know, from 12 o'clock you, you, you are declared reconciled. It's not gonna work like that. Solution is larger interaction. Why these kind of documents are important? Why it's important that population will have an opportunity to interact? Because only when you have a trust, and trust will come only through interactions, you can find a political solutions as well. Removing external factors and enhancing interaction between split communities are the formula that I believe will work. I don't know better lubricant than money in this kind of conflicts. Let people trade. Let people interact. Let them do things together and you will find solution on the grassroots. And remove the international factor and you will find solution in the region. That's my humble opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Very happy to also make some news that you should feel to live tweet the new passports that have uh, come out. Um, next, uh, we'll go to uh, Peter Semnaby. Uh, Peter is, uh, I think, one of those figures that has uh, seen the issue as a practitioner um, of course, he's the former uh, European Union uh, Special Representative of the South Caucasus and has tires, tirelessly uh, tried to promote uh, reconciliation and also EU engagement uh, with these issues and shuttling back and forth uh, uh, from all these different areas and capitals. Um, Peter is also a former uh, mission head of the OSCE um, to Latvia uh, and uh, Croatia. Croatia, that was the region, I'm trying to do it without the bite. And, 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 and just by, by brief introduction, I, I, I first met Peter, I don't think he remembers this and we haven't discussed it, in the Light Lake Bled Forum right after the August 2008 war and I was struck at the time by 
A, how reflective he was about the international community's, I think, failures uh, in, in, in containing um, the conflict allowed to spiraling, but also how open he's been um, to academics, uh, to uh, different sort of inputs. And one of the results of his tireless efforts was getting the EU in agreement on a engagement and non-recognition policy, which he formalized uh, um, um, before his, his departure. So um, we're really grateful to have you here and gain some of your perspectives on, on the issues here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I, well, I clearly remember that uh, event at the Bled Forum. I think we both participated in the largest panel uh, that has ever been o organized <laughs> in world history in, in a conference. It was, um, the, the, this forum uh, took place, uh, I think, three weeks after the end of, two or three weeks after the, uh, af after the Russian-Jordan War in, in 2008. And basically, uh, it, the panel accommodated everybody who thought they, in the conference, who thought they would have anything to contribute <laughs> on, <laughs> on that conflict. Uh, but I think it was a good, um, uh, good discussion. And um, uh, it contributed also to a lot of the, uh, the things that we have been talking about here, including the um, uh, non-recognition and engagement uh, strategy of the European Union that Alex uh, mentioned. Um, before I, I start to describe um, uh, a bit in, in more detail how we uh, uh, have elaborated uh, policy and how we have worked together with, with Timuri and uh, and the Georgians, uh, let me uh, associate myself, uh, though, in the beginning with everybody here who has taken issue with the labeling of the conflicts as frozen. <laughs> uh, I have, um, even before the war, I, I uh, have to uh, underline here, uh, warned against that uh, kind of label. Uh, these conflicts uh, have never been frozen. Uh, they have, if, if you take your temperature scale uh, as a uh, measure, uh, they, they are, have rather been found somewhere immediately uh, below the boiling point instead of below the freezing point. So I, I, uh, I prefer to call them simmering conflicts rather than uh, frozen conflicts. That being said, um, there is um, obviously a temptation uh, to um, uh, return to, to this uh, terminology and um, uh, the, 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 this kind of image. And um, I see from time to time uh, a tendency uh, from, on the part of the international community, and that includes uh, also the European Union, uh, to try to refreeze uh, mm -hmm. the conflicts. Um, and if I would uh, give any one message uh, here, uh, uh, it is uh, a warning uh, against any uh, such attempt. It's uh, obviously attractive uh, in the short run uh, to um, find some kind of uh, arrangements on security uh, that uh, addresses a few issues, but not the underlying fundamental ones. Uh, to buy stability uh, in, in the short run, perhaps even for the medium term, for the next year, two, three, five, ten. Uh, but unless we uh, 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 deal seriously uh, with the underlying uh, issues, we may very well find ourselves in the situation, or I will even put it strongly, we will find ourselves in the situation uh, down the line, uh, perhaps in a decade or so, where the underlying tensions uh, will be impossible to handle, just as they were in August, uh, as they became in August of uh, 2008. So this call that has also uh, been made here from this podium by a lot of people uh, today uh, to take conflict resolution mm -hmm. uh, seriously uh, is one that I would uh, uh, very strongly subscribe to uh, myself uh, as well. Um, now, the uh, non-recognition and uh, engagement policy of the uh, European Union. This is uh, a policy, as, uh, uh, as is obvious from the labeling of it, it's based on two pillars, two legs, uh, non-recognition on the one hand and engagement on the other hand, where um, uh, we really have formulated in such a way that one leg is not uh, thinkable uh, without uh, the other one. 
Non-recognition uh, uh, without uh, engagement is a sterile policy at best and a counterproductive one at worst. Uh, it will uh, uh, only serve uh, to push uh, these territories uh, further away uh, from Georgia and, and uh, to make uh, the conflict resolution in, in the longer run even more uh, difficult. At the same time, engagement without a firm line on the um, uh, issues of principle, um, the red lines or whatever you prefer to, uh, to call them, uh, is uh, a potential slippery slope uh, where uh, we may find ourselves in a situation where it's no longer possible to uh, handle uh, the situation, where, where every step may be instrumentalized uh, to advance uh, uh, positions uh, leading towards a greater degree of formal uh, uh, recognition of, of these uh, territories. Um, uh, this policy was long in coming. I started uh, shortly after I became the special representative in 2006 to present a whole series of papers to the EU member states that uh, finally led to, to a rather broad-based expert mission that mm -hmm. traveled to uh, Georgia, including uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2007 to produce uh, extensive recommendations uh, on various kinds of confidence uh, building uh, measures, including such issues as trade issues that uh, have uh, remained mm. on, on the agenda. Um, it was very difficult. Um, uh, the discussions that we had uh, were very difficult at the time, and I can say this now uh, without revealing any secrets, since it's, it's even in the WikiLeaks telegrams. The, the, the American mm -hmm. mission in, in Brussels w w w w was following a, uh, our internal discussions very, uh, be, uh, very closely, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> more closely than I could ever have expected. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and if, if, you, if you find these cables, you, you will see uh, that uh, there were several reasons for, uh, for these uh, controversies within the European Union. Uh, there was, of course, uh, the uh, juxtaposition with other conflicts where sovereignty uh, issues yeah. were at stake. Yeah. Kosovo, but Cyprus as well, not, yeah. not, not least uh, Cyprus. Um, this was, uh, in fact, the, um, the trigger for this two-leg approach that I, uh, for us to, to consider this two-leg approach that I, uh, I mentioned. We, it was necessary also for our internal discussions to uh, uh, find a way of, of, of reconciling the formal issues, the non-recognition part and the engagement part uh, on, uh, on the other hand. There were other reasons for the internal controversy as well. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, or in particular, the possible impact uh, of um, any engagement uh, policy uh, on other EU policies that were deemed more important uh, than Georgia by many uh, member states, and, and in particular, the relations with uh, the Russian uh, Federation. Now, the... Um, uh, this, this meant that we, we didn't really reach as far as we had hoped uh, by 2008. But in 2008, we had the war, uh, and I think somebody mentioned silver linings of the war uh, here. I, I, I think it's rather bizarre to talk about silver linings, but I, I will still da dare to add uh, one uh, myself, and that is the fact that the European Union and the international community uh, realized uh, how in, or at least for a while, uh, how important um, uh, uh, the um, uh, unresolved uh, conflicts uh, were and, and, and are and how important uh, it is to uh, find uh, solutions to, uh, to these issues. Uh, that being said, the most immediate concern, obviously, after the war was to find uh, ways of ensuring security um, uh, along the administrative boundaries and, and to address the acute refugee and IDP issues uh, that uh, uh, occurred uh, as a result of the war. And these then became the topics of the so-called Geneva talks that are still going on that were managed not by me but by my colleague uh, Pierre Morel. Um, um, 
it did, however, uh, very soon after the war, uh, become increasingly obvious that a broader approach than the Geneva talks uh, was necessary in order to um, re-establish and, and further develop contacts across the administrative boundaries between population groups uh, uh, and, and for, for the European Union, for the international community to establish some kind of footprint and leverage uh, in, in these uh, territories. Um, uh, and, and, and this is where the serious discussion on the non-recognition and, uh, and, um, uh, and engagement policy started. Um, we had uh, uh, very serious discussions, uh, profound discussions uh, with uh, the Georgian government at the time represented uh, in particular by Timur Yakubashvili at the time in his position then as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for uh, Reintegration. Um, uh, we did see uh, a lot of problems uh, at the time uh, with the Georgian approach. Um, the, the, we did uh, see a need to amend the, the very restrictive Georgian policy that was uh, adopted in the immediate aftermath of the war, in particular the law on the occupied um, uh, territories. Um, uh, we did see a need to uh, encourage Georgia to see the conflicts, uh, conflict or conflicts in a broader perspective than just the interstate perspective that for natural reason was the predominant one after, uh, after the war. Uh, that is to, to acknowledge uh, clearly the, the inter-community um, aspects. Uh, and we did see a need to encourage Georgia to reach out to the populations of the breakaway regions and to also, uh, in, in cases where, where this was used, uh, uh, motivated to the uh, de facto authorities, uh, in, 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 in some individual cases um, um, at least. Um, uh, we were, the European Union was guided by a number of, uh, uh, of, of assumptions uh, in this work. Uh, uh, one was that we could not afford to leave these territories just in Russia's hands. Uh, that we, uh, uh, in order to promote conflict resolution in the longer term, we had to make sure that the breakaway uh, territories develop in a way that is as similar, possible, uh, similar as possible to the rest of, of, of Georgia. And we were also guided by, uh, by, by humanitarian uh, concerns. Um, I have a lot of prepared notes here, but I will uh, skip uh, a little bit uh, uh, of it and, and um, uh, mention to come back to a timeline uh, to the timeline that we, we produced in our first policy papers in, in the beginning of 2009 um, uh, and in parallel uh, held a, uh, a discussion uh, with the Georgian, uh, Georgian government. Uh, Timuri invited the, Europe, uh, the international community to work on a uh, strategy um, uh, together with the Georgian government, uh, also in 2009. We had several successful uh, brainstorming meetings in London, Tbilisi, uh, Paris. Uh, we did uh, canvas some of the member states and, and the um, EU institutions for support in, in the terms of advice. We had a very senior German uh, advisor, the, the former uh, permanent representative of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany to the GDR at the time who provided advice. We, we uh, uh, hired uh, an EU advisor who was, in fact, uh, did, did some of the work, well, the, most of the work on the, the, the status neutral travel documents was done by the Georgian government, but to, uh, we, the, the, through uh, an external advisor, or uh, several external advisors, the, the EU helped also to provide the um, some of the best uh, expertise mm. uh, available on uh, this uh, issue. Um, the Georgian uh, uh, strategy on the occupied territories, we, I think, was a uh, good uh, document. It was still problematic in, in, um, in some ways. In, in terms of substance, it, it, was, it was a very good document still problematic in, in some ways, um, many of, of the 
issues were, were, were linked uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the status issue and therefore a hard sell uh, mm -hmm. on the other side of the administrative uh, uh, boundaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, we then worked on, a, uh, also together with the Georgian, um, uh, provided input on, on the next generation of document that the Jordan government produced, the, the action plan on the, uh, on the occupied territories, which uh, uh, was indeed uh, welcomed uh, by the European Union, which continues uh, to provide the basis for many of the measures that are, 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 are now being uh, taken. We had, uh, at the same time, some uh, rough spots, uh, I, I, I should say. Um, we, uh, there was a discussion on, on modalities for international uh, engagement, um, which uh, was, uh, without going into the details here, I, I, I think it uh, demonstrated uh, that there was still a need to work on uh, the trust uh, between the, the Jordan government and the international mm. uh, community uh, on the part of the uh, international community, I, I should say that we did not really have clear faith that the Jordan, uh, 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 how, how far uh, the, the Jordan government was prepared to go on these issues. On the, Jor on the part of the Jordan government, uh, there was a fear uh, that um, the international community and the European Union would not stand by its uh, declared positions on, on support for Georgian territorial integrity and, uh, and so on if push uh, uh, came to shove uh, mm -hmm. for further down, uh, mm -hmm. down the line. Um, the uh, um, I can talk a lot also about the, 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 the different uh, uh, policy discussions uh, at this stage that we had and, and, and also that were going on in Georgia, but I will save that to the question and answer uh, session and instead uh, mention uh, that in terms of implementation uh, of our, uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, our, um, our policy, um, uh, we um, uh, have perhaps not reached uh, quite um, as, as far as we would have uh, liked uh, at the stage. That is not to say that nothing has been done, and we see here the, the, the status neutral travel documents that the Jordan government have produced. I think that is very uh, a, a very good uh, good step that uh, uh, could uh, provide the basis for further measures as well. The EU presence and leverage uh, in the breakaway uh, regions is still fairly limited. We don't have any access, meaningful access to South, South Ossetia. Uh, mm. There is no critical mass and there is a lack of relevant interlocutors mm. in South Ossetia. It's, uh, in, in Abkhazia, the situation is much better. Uh, the um, uh, uh, EU is turning its attention um, uh, elsewhere uh, uh, lately, both due to its ex internal restructuring and, and the need to uh, pay attention to other uh, regions. Um, uh, there are several problems and trade-offs here that have to be, uh, have to be um, uh, addressed on the part of the, of the EU. Uh, in terms of EU presence in the uh, conflict areas, uh, this has to be done in such a way that it doesn't undermine territorial integrity. Uh, we have to provide uh, ass assistance, be it in the form of healthcare, humanitarian issues, or um, uh, fighting organized crime or whatever, in such a way that we don't uh, strengthen, um, uh, uh, that, that, that we take care not, not to uh, engage in, 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 in such a way that we, we um, uh, we, we, we have to be careful about the kind of bodies, institutions, and so on that, that, that we support in, in the uh, breakaway regions. 
uh, to the extent that we encourage travel mm. uh, of uh, people from the uh, breakaway uh, regions for education and so on, we, we have to make sure that this happens in such a way that it does not uh, uh, encourage the uh, Russian passportization. Mm -hmm. We have to engage also in a way that um, uh, does not provoke any Russian uh, uh, countermeasures. Uh, and we have to engage in a way uh, that we don't lose sight of the uh, interstate uh, conflicts. Um, how can this policy be develop, uh, developed into in, in the future? Um, well, I, I think there is uh, a great deal of potential if the EU can make offers that are a clear benefit to the people in the breakaway territories. Um, uh, if we can do this in a way um, of uh, uh, based on trust between the European Union and Georgia, and, and the trust, uh, this trust requires firmness on the non-recognition more than anything else. Uh, we uh, should continue to emphasize the uh, fulfillment of the uh, ceasefire uh, agreement from the war, otherwise the engagement may contribute to cementing a new status quo without resolution of the underlying issues that I uh, warned about. We have to make, uh, in, in parallel, make progress on the overall relationship with the European Union, both to maintain good relations with Tbilisi and to provide an example and a clear objective to strive towards for people in the breakaway regions. We have to make sure that the EU remains united, meanwhile. We have to coordinate with the United States, uh, preferably to make sure that there is mutual support, but at a minimum to avoid uh, working across purposes. And we have to ensure also that there is a minimum of understanding with uh, Russia. The EU has to be seen here as a non-threatening actor in order to be able to, uh, to, to be uh, effective. I think we can extend the scope of, of the policy further down the line. Um, uh, I, one idea that we talked about at a conference a year ago was, for example, to engage uh, the uh, breakaway regions in a kind of uh, EU shadow approximation process in mm -hmm. order to make sure that, they, uh, that the, the gap in terms of development between Georgia and these uh, regions does not increase, but, 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 but that they, they move in the, uh, not only the same direction, but asymptotically together mm -hmm. to... to uh, um, uh, we can, uh, be, I believe, create more extensive platforms for contact with, with people in the breakaway uh, regions through an EU presence, information offices, and so on. We can perhaps consider representation of um, people from these regions at various regional non-government uh, forums, uh, civil society forums, uh, perhaps municipal representatives at regional gatherings of municipalities, and, uh, and so on. Uh, we can certainly uh, enhance uh, the efforts that we have, uh, that, that the EU has started to make in terms of scholarships. Uh, the EU also needs to, um, to um, uh, consider uh, what it can do in, in order to um, uh, move towards a common understanding on travel issues and, and visa uh, policy. Um, if we manage um, um, to do all this, I do, I, I'm, I'm convinced uh, that this kind of uh, uh, engagement policy uh, will uh, create uh, a basis uh, for uh, addressing also the, the, the underlying issues and um, uh, make sure uh, that we don't, uh, do not only uh, satisfy ourselves uh, with uh, a conflict uh, prevention perspective, a refreezing of, of the current mm -hmm. situation, but that mm -hmm. we also, uh, and in particular, uh, address the, the, the underlying issues and move uh, towards uh, a resolution of the conflicts. Thank Excellent. you, and uh, sorry for no, no. taking so much time. No, no, Peter, thank you very much. Those are invaluable insights. Uh, next we go to Tom DeWall, uh, another a uh, frequent visitor to us here at Columbia who probably needs no introduction to this audience, but I'll give a brief one anyway. He's currently senior associate with the Russian Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, he, previously, he worked at the Institute for War and Peace reporting in London, and he has been a journalist uh, with all types of distinguished uh, publications. 
Uh, Tom is the co-author of many books on the Caucasus, and his most recent one is called The Caucasus, an introduction which Tom, I think, is actually mistitled, uh, because it is an accessible book, but it also provides just really unique and wonderful insights, I think, for people who have uh, been interested in this region, especially in terms of some of the nitty-gritty what went on during these conflicts that, that, that I think uh, um, would be of interest to a specialized audience, too. Um, so, Tom, uh, welcome again. We'd be very interested in hearing your take on um, some of these uh, uh, moving forward policy type issues. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I'd like to echo everyone else in, in thanking Harriman and you and uh, Lincoln for inviting me and for putting on this very um, important event. Also, I'd like to echo everyone else in, in saying that um, I don't. Uh, agree with the, the term frozen conflicts. My, my, my um, preferred term is smoldering conflicts. I think maybe we should, uh, should uh, gather a list of, of, of alternative terminology. Um, I originally prepared a, a rather descriptive presentation, but I, I felt that was very covered, well covered in, in the morning. So I'm going to try and have a more of a, a, of a prescriptive um, presentation, which, which I think fits the themes of, of this panel and follows on, on, on quite directly from what we just heard from Peter. Um, we also followed on from a conference that we held, uh, I, ha I organized and held earlier in the week in Washington um, about 20 years of independence for the South Caucasus, which, in which the, the kind of overarching theme was very much about local capacity and ownership of, of problems, um, encouraging um, a sort of different paradigm in the region in which um, th these um, three countries are regarded as sovereign grown-ups who, who should stop um, looking to kind of parents and, and step-parents to solve their problems and, and be taking more ownership um, of their problems. Um, when it comes to the conflicts, one of our Georgians um, guests, I think, put it very eloquently when she said, um, sort of paraphrased John F. Kennedy and said, think not what um, your opponent should do for you, but what you should do for your opponent um, when it comes to, to, to the conflicts. So I think that was very well put. Obviously, um, um, there will be objections. When, uh, in my presentation, I will again try and put this rather more local and non-geopolitical perspective on, on my, my presentation. I, I clearly anticipate the objections um, that you can't take out the geopolitical dimension uh, when it comes to Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia, the Russian dimension. But I would argue that um, this can be a self-fulfilling prophecy that if, if, if you only look to the geopolitical and the outside dimension, um, you are undermining your own local capacity to deal um, with issues. And that there are many actions which can be taken to strengthen local dynamics. Um, and I do believe local, um, there is an underlying pragmatism um, in the Caucasus which needs to be cultivated and which um, reaches often rather below the radar um, around politics and around geopolitics, and we should be encouraging that. And getting, um, we often hear, I think one of the paradoxes for me of the Caucasus is we often hear extremely fiery rhetoric, um, and, and then under the surface, in fact, some of the same people are engaged in very pragmatic um, cooperation with one another. I think we've all been at conferences where, where the two people who've had the fiercest clash in the panel are the two people uh, laughing and drinking with one another over dinner, and I do think, I do think that's something that we should explore more and, and, and encourage in in our actions on 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 the Caucasus. So, um, in my sort of search for some real outcomes, I, I also want to just say, lay out for what for me are a few kind of ground rules, a baseline of of, of how I would frame these these conflicts, and and I would also include Transnistria. Um, first of all, I would say there was, I would say, my, for me, important ground rule, there's no moral bias in these conflicts, or put it another way, there are no angels um, in these conflicts. Each side has legitimate grievances um, and can point to a narrative in which they suffered uh, ethnic cleansing at various points in conflicts has been committed by all sides. Um, if we look at, um, you know, South Ossetia, Obviously, the, the behavior of Gamsa Khodia's regime in 90 to 92 set a baseline um, before we then move on to 2004 and 2008. If we look at Abkhazia, Kitovani's intervention in 92, um, 
and the sacking of, of Suhumi then set up a baseline which then um, then followed on with the with the reverse happening in 93 with the Georgians being expelled from Abkhazia Karabakh um, I can draw a long ledger of, of what each side has done to another clearly the, the outcome was an Armenian victory um, in which more Azeris were expelled but there were also moments in which for example in 92 uh, mm. half the territory of, of Karabakh um, was uh, under Azerbaijani control and the Armenians many Armenians thought they were facing deportation from Karabakh I think this what this tells us is that there's all sides feel insecurity and all sides feel that there are small nations under some kind of existential threat from the other side in the conflict another point I'd make is that these um, four entities are small and I would say non-viable or, or to put it a bit more charitably very distant from being independent states I would never say never but I, I see very very distant mm -hmm. perspectives um, obviously there are caveats that the um, the Minsk process envisages a, they don't actually call it a referendum, they call it a legally binding expression of will by the population of Karabakh on status at some point in the future and I think that's something we should talk a bit more about because that also envisages an interesting concept of interim status in the meantime and um, Abkhazia you know a pre-war population of half a million is potentially a viable state I, I would I would I would again put that in, in very cautious terms um, in terms of its location and, and, and size um, I, but again I would see that the the long process it would need to go to acquire legitimacy it, it's very hard uh, to envisage but I think an, another important point to make is we shouldn't delegitimize people's aspirations um, that um, and we see this um, across Europe in places like the Basque country and Scotland um, where um, you know European polity can take into account that people do have aspirations um, to sovereignty or independence we may think that's non-viable but we should factor that in, into our political calculations um, so in, in that sense I think Peter has it absolutely right non-recognition is, is the right framework to be looking at all policies um, I wouldn't say it's non-recognition forever but non-recognition for the foreseeable future um, as far as we can see um, but also clearly um, as Peter's also said that's um, not should be a recipe for doing nothing and we, we are dealing with people and I would say that people on either sides of these conflict divides are kind of hostages of the status quo the current residents of these territories um, have in a sense become second class human beings they have um, many they lack many of the rights that, that, that um, citizens of, of, of recognized states and they find it very difficult to you know many of them find it difficult to travel have a bank account um, it's thing, many things that many of us um, take for granted of course you know in, including more trivial things like um, you know who do they support in the which football team do they support um, so they're, they're in a sense hostages of the situation but equally the IDPs on the other side are hostages of the de facto um, territories because they can't go home until that status is resolved so there's a, there each, each side is sort of holding a, a gun to the head of the other uh, and, and making it worse for them um, while these conflict is resolved um, and both sides are threatening to shoot the hostage um, another point I would make is that I, I, I I would agree with Corey that we should that these are local administrations which therefore have partial legitimacy as uh, local um, administrations and, and this is actually something in a way that's acknowledged if we look at um, Chisinau, Baku and Tbilisi by the kind of offers the kind of peace plans that they've come up the way Azerbaijan talks about high, highest possible autonomy peace plans in which um, Abkhaz are offered the vice presidency and which Chisinau talks about sh sharing uh, high levels of sovereignty so there's an inconsistency in their current position that we do not deal with these people or deal, do deal with these de facto leaders and yet what we're actually um, offering them uh, on paper and I think that that, that, that needs to be explored that, that, that a little more flexibility in the fact that these people these leaderships do have partial legitimacy through elections and obviously these elections in which not all the electorate 
um, potential electorate can take part, but they are also um, competitive elections. In, in fact, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, given the limited electorate, given that very obvious caveat, they're probably some of the most competitive elections we see in the entire Soviet space. Um, twice in Abkhazia, the pro-Moscow candidate um, Khadjimba and Shamba has been defeated um, and replaced by Bagapsh and Ankhvab. And now we also see Bibilov being defeated, the pro-Moscow candidate, by Gioyeva. So clearly there is a, a popular uh, aspiration being expressed there, which um, given, again, some caveats, we can't um, ignore. So I would say that if we look across Eurasia, there's a sort of a sliding scale of the acuteness of the conflict um, and um, in which we would start with Cyprus and Moldova on one end and Karabakh on the other with the Georgian conflicts sort of in the middle more, more towards the Karabakh end of, of the scale. Um, and um, in this sense, some, some, some practical recommendations coming stemming from that um, because it seems to me um, there's also something to be learned from the fact that Cyprus and, and Moldova are relatively more benign. Why is that the case? Um, and I think um, there's a, what I would see as a, a law of these states that the more open the situation, um, the less the conflict region has to, f has to fear, um, the less its sense of insecurity, the greater the engagement and the greater the perspective of long-term uh, solution. Uh, so this is really is an appeal for maximum pragmatism and maxim maximum non-status, um, maxim maximum, excuse me, status neutral uh, engagement. I think that's Gerard's survey also, I think, um, bore that out w in which we saw uh, much more positive attitudes in Transnistria um, than in um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, and um, um, for example, th this is borne out on the ground where you see uh, things which you couldn't imagine in the Caucasus happening in Transnistria. For example, the Moldovan football soccer team playing its international matches on the territory of Transnistria because there's a bigger stadium in Transnistria than there is in Chisinau. Um, and um, all sorts of people going back and forth across the boundary, um, Transnistrians spending their weekends in, in, in Chisinau and so, on, and so on. Sadly, I think South Ossetia was actually much more in that, South Ossetia has got worse, South Ossetia was actually much more in that category um, up until 2004. We recently had a South Ossetian guest in, in, in Washington who said, she openly said, I couldn't dream of living outside Georgia until 2004. That was, um, it was, you know, if you, if you told me that I would live outside Georgia up until, I would have killed you, she said. But that was the year, unfortunately, in which things started sliding backwards, um, in which there was the Georgian offensive in the summer of 2004, and also, crucially, the closure of the Egneti market, which was on the border between Georgia and South Ossetia, the biggest wholesale market in the Caucasus, which was basically made South Ossetia um, if not 100%, 95% part of the Georgian economy. Now, the Georgian government, on domestic grounds, had a reasons to close down that market because it was a source of smuggling, but I think they solved one problem and created a much bigger one. That was the day in which South Ossetia stopped being part of the Georgian economy and was reoriented towards the north. So, so I think a solution should have been sought to legalize that market rather than close it down. Um, we also see... Um, signs of pragmatism in the Gali region of, of, of Abkhazia with um, Georgians or Mingrillians or yeah, I think, um, I think uh, if they call themselves both that, that was, that was a self-description I believe in, in, um, in Gerard's survey going back, back and forth um, and um, I think still below the radar um, there's a lot more traffic pro probably across that border than, than, than is often publicly acknowledged. You hear about um, Abkhaz crossing that border to get medical treatment in Zugdidi. Um, and you also, I've also he heard recently about how quite a number of, of, of Georgians are actually working um, in Gagra on, um, on, um, in the north of Abkhazia. So I think there's a lot more traffic um, than is publicly acknowledged. So there is, a, again, a pragmatism that's still there, but obviously has become much more difficult since uh, 2008. Um, 
Then at the further end of the scale, we have um, Nagorno-Karabakh um, and Baku, in which um, um, the Azerbaijani government has been known to kind of ban people who even visited uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, in, um, in which they do everything in their power to, to delegitimize um, um, Nagorno-Karabakh and travel there. Um, um, to give you one rather absurd example, when I was in my previous job, I edited an article for IWPR, it was a kind of fluffy human interest article about a couple of Chinese cooks working in a Chinese restaurant in Nagorno Karabakh, um, one of whom was dating an Armenian girl. It was a nice little human interest story about a couple of Chinese who had ended up in uh, working in a restaurant in Nagorno Karabakh. The, um, someone in the Azerbaijani foreign ministry read this article and wrote a letter of protest to the Chinese embassy in Baku saying um, these two Chinese cooks are illegally on the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. So it's reached, it reaches, unfortunately, those sort of levels uh, when it comes to Karabakh. Um, and I would argue, um, obviously, I think you're getting my drift, that, that um, the more isolation you impose on these territories, um, the more you lose them, that, in fact, it's, it's absolutely um, counterproductive. Um, so my first recipe is maximally open borders um, and use, use of soft power, particularly, I think, in the case of somewhere like South Ossetia, I think that could be, um, still has the potential to be extremely effective. That's my first piece of advice. My second one is greater pragmatism on the issue of elections. Um, I, again, no one's suggesting that we um, recognize these elections in these places as um, elections to sovereign territories. Um, but again, there are, I think, international inconsistencies which come, um, which um, I scratch my head over. Um, let me just read you a, a quotation um, from April 19th, 2010, um, about Cyprus. The United States congratulates Mr. Davis or Erolu for his victory in elections held to select the leader of the Turkish Cypri Cypriot community. We encourage him to continue to pursue a settlement that reunites Cyprus into a bi-zonal and bi-communal federation through a process based on UN parameters, blah, blah, blah. And then actually, I think er Erolu may even have visited the United States uh, since then. I think he does um, annually during UN General Assembly um, week. And then again, similar comments from, from Stefan Fuller of the EU. But then, then the United States absolutely condemning elections in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Why not, um, I don't see any consistency in this, why not um, congratulate An Alexander Ankvab as the le leader of, not of the Turkish Cypriot, but of the, um, you know, the community currently residing in Abkhazia or some other formula which makes it clear that you don't regard him as a sovereign leader, but as you, as you regard him as a de facto political actor um, in a conflict settlement and in a region. So that's one, another recommendation is greater pragmatism on the issue of elections. And again on travel, and I think, um, um, I think it's interesting that I think something that Gerard survey again brought out is that these regions um, do not want to be part of um, Russia, that they have a distinct identity, particularly in the case of Abkhazia, and they do aspire to, ordinary people do aspire to travel to the outside world. The question is how. Um, I think the, um, the status neutral passports, which Timuri has been showing us, are a good project, but I fear that they are, that they are rather behind the curve. If, if Abkhaz and Assetians can be persuaded to accept them, great. Um, but I do, I would, it would be a shame if the existence of these documents was used as an excuse to block the aspirations of thousands of young people to study, for example, in Europe. I think that would be entirely counterproductive. So I think, again, pragmatism needs to be applied. If, for reasons of fear or um, that they don't want to cross the boundary or whatever, people are not taking these documents, other ways, I think, have to be found um, for those people to, to travel on different documents. Again, t Turkish Cyprus presents an interesting example in which um, um, the consulates uh, of several countries, including UK and US, stamp um, Turkish Cypriot passports with US visas um, with, from the Nicosia consulate. Um, again, 
saying that, and the implication that th these are not sovereign passports, these are just travel documents to which we have applied a UK or a US visa. Again, I, I, would, I would argue that that could be um, an applicable solution um, to the, the travel issue, which I think is very important, um, and I think very important in the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia for Georgia, um, to let um, young people in particular from these regions breathe some European air and non-Russian air. Finally, um, longer-term issues of sovereignty and, and large-scale IDB return. Um, again, I would say, unfortunately, IDPs, I think if we look around the world, it's, it's unrealistic to expect large numbers of IDPs to return before there is some clarity on the sovereignty issue. We see that in Cyprus, been going on since 74. We see that in Palestine, which has been going on since 48. So I think those two are linked. Um, and I think, again, I would urge maximum pragmatism and pursuit of mutually acceptable creative sovereignty goals. In this respect, I think the idea of interim status for Nagorno-Karabakh is very interesting and worth discussing more. Um, there are some, it has been fleshed out a little. Uh, for example, drafts I've seen gives Nagorno-Karabakh observer status at the OSCE um, to observe, um, not membership, but observer status at the OSCE. Um, that's one model. An another model, interesting model from, um, is the model of Andorra, um, which has, since the year 1278, has had two heads of state, um, both the King of France, now the President of France, and the Bishop of a province of, of Catalonia. Um, it, it has two postal systems, two education systems. It's a tiny place. Um, so it's, 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 um, it seems rather cumbersome that a tiny place in the mountains should be associated with both France and Spain. But it basically gives Andorans uh, the right to choose and this kind of nominal sovereignty. Um, and I think that's, again, um, a model that could be possibly applied um, in the case of, of Abkhazia or, or South Ossetia. Um, but, it, but we always get back to, to the issue of security and, um, and these... Uh, um, basically the fact that these um, small de facto territories, whatever you want to call them, will always, um, if they feel that their security is under threat, they will always threaten to shoot the hostage. They will always threaten to, to block any progress. Um, and in that respect, uh, there's a story that, that many of you will know, but I will still repeat it um, for those of you who don't know it, um, which I think illustrates my point perfectly. It's a story about here in the mid-90s, uh, Arkady Gukasyan, the, the leader of then of the Karabakh Armenians, was invited to talks in the Orland Islands. This is this is this is my end. Yeah, um, Orland Islands, which, as you know, are, are the Swedish-speaking um, parts of Finland that have mm -hmm. substantial autonomy. Um, obviously, there was a, a not very concealed agenda here to 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 to, set, to demonstrate that the Orland Islands could be a good model uh, for Karabakh and for other Caucasian. Uh, disputed territories. Um, they have um, their own constitution. They have many opt-outs from, from the um, Finnish state, but they are nominally under, un, under the Finnish state. And after a couple of days, the, the, his host, Dooley, popped Arkady Gukasan the question and said, well, isn't this a good model? Wouldn't you like to subscribe to the Orland Islands model for Karabakh? And Gukasan then surprised his host and said, yes, I agree. It's a done deal. And they looked a bit surprised, and he said, give me the piece of paper tomorrow. I will sign it. Karabakh will become part of Finland. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, that basically tells us what we need to know. Um, it's, a, it's, it's less about sovereignty than it is about security, survival, existence, whatever you want to call it. And so um, anything that removes the sense of insecurity and threat from these places, I think, has to be the first um, step in a positive chain of events which in, in turn means that they start um, putting their own guns away um, threatening less to shoot the hostage and, and, and to come to the table to have some kind of acceptable arrangement in the future thank you thank you Tom and our final panel today but by no means least is Sabine Fisher um, who has been a senior research fellow at the European Union um, <coughs> European Union Institute for Security Studies, soon to be returned to SWP, is that right, in, uh, in Berlin. And Sabine's work is very well known uh, throughout the region, 
uh, and externally as well. She's published extensively not only on these regions and these conflicts, but articles on Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, um, and as well as sort of EU policy towards the region. Um, she has a particular interest in the Georgian Abkhaz uh, conflict. She has convened many different seminars and meetings and events on the topic, um, as well as spent uh, time in the field uh, in these locations. And she also uh, acts as a policy advisor um, uh, for uh, many EU uh, bodies and organizations. So Sabine, uh, we're extremely grateful to have you here and look forward to your comments. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. Um, <coughs> in my presentation, uh, I will really focus on EU policy and try to provide a broader view on the development of EU policy uh, towards the unresolved conflicts, that's my terminology by the way, um, which will hopefully complement what Peter presented um, in detail on the development of the non-recognition and engagement policy. And I would also like to mention that our projects, seminars, conferences, also what we do uh, in Abkhazia um, has evolved very much in cooperation uh, with uh, the Office of the European Union Special Representative when Peter was, uh, was uh, still uh, was in office. So I think that was a very fruitful uh, cooperation for both sides. So, okay, so I'm gonna focus on the broader picture of um, EU, pol EU uh, policy. Um, I was very much uh, encouraged by what Corey said about the Europeans paying more attention to the detail because this, that's what I'm going to try. Uh, I will try to avoid EU jargon. I'm afraid I won't manage completely, but I hope, uh, yeah, I hope uh, you forgive me for um, being a little bit EU-ish uh, in the following 14 minutes. Okay, I would, I would like to, uh, to base my, my presentation on, on three assumptions. The first assum um, assumption, I understand the title, Designing Policy as Developing a Strategic Approach. Uh, towards um, both the unresolved conflicts but also uh, the, the unrecognized ter uh, territories. And with respect to that, I unfortunately have to say that the EU so far um, has been rather weak in developing a strategic, um, proactive and design policy in that area. Um, I would like to share a quote with you um, by um, a very high-ranking uh, official from the Council of the European Union at an EUISS conference very recently, two weeks ago. This person said, not referring to the South Caucasus, but I think it's a very enlightening quote, um, we let things happen. When something happens, we put our label on it and say, this is our policy. <laughs> and I think this is pretty char characteristic. But I learned today that this is not so different from US policy, so that's good. Um, <laughs> you can argue with me afterwards. Uh, my second assumption is that the EU has only very recently started to move from a policy that was mainly focused on its relations with uh, the countries affected by the conflicts and included a conflict resolution um, aspect to cautiously considering um, a policy towards the unrecognized territories without, however, and I think Peter's presentation made that very clear, um, without, however, questioning its commitment to the territorial integrity, particularly um, <clears throat> of Georgia. And here I, I also see parallels with what has been said about US policy, a little less with respect to Azerbaijan. My third assumption is that this, and this is uh, actually forward looking, that this additional dimension um, is of crucial importance when it comes to conflict transformation, which in my view uh, should be medi the medium and long-term goal of EU policy towards the unre uh, unresolved uh, conflicts and, and the unrecognized territories in the region. So those are my three assumptions. And um, in the rest of my presentation, I will first look into the development of EU policy and try to give you um, a broader picture. Then talk a little bit about the conditions of and also obstacles to a more strategic approach uh, of, the, of the EU and then um, come to my conclusions. <clears throat> now, I think it is important to 
uh, keep in mind that there are three developments which, which formed the background uh, or provided the background of um, the EU's deeper engagement in the unresolved conflicts in the region. The first and probably most important uh, development was the preparation of the EU enlargement um, in 2004 and the fact that the EU and both the affected or, and the affected countries became direct neighbors and the conflicts moved closer to the EU's borders. Um, the second development was almost simultaneously the development of the common foreign and security policy and the European security and defense policy. And this provided a, a space for uh, more reflection, more debate about the EU's role as a regional and global actor, but it also provided the EU with policy instruments that had not existed before. And the, for instance, the European Union special representatives are uh, one of these uh, instruments. And related, at the beginning of the last decade, there was a much more active debate about um, what the EU should do or could do um, with respect to conflict prevention. And this was very closely related to uh, the, the common and foreign security policy debate. So as a result of these three um, developments or discourses, if you like, um, there are three different groups of policy documents that form the basis of EU policy, um, both towards the, it's the, the EU's Eastern Neighbourhood, or Eurasia if you like, and the EU's role in conflict resolution. The first group of documents um, is the European Neighbourhood Policy and related documents. And here I think it's very interesting uh, to see that in those documents, <coughs> over in the course of the year you find more and more concrete language as to how the EU should uh, become engaged in conflict resolution. So from very general expressions of the need to contribute, to reinforce an EU contribution um, to conflict resolution in the first ENP European Neighbourhood Policy Strategy Papers of 2003-2004, um, to rather concrete formulations, for instance, and here again I, I will give you a quote, um, in the European Neighbourhood Policy Review, which was adopted and published in May this year. Here, this document says, the, the EU intends to enhance its support for confidence building and outreach to breakaway territories for international efforts and structures related to the conflicts and, once that stage is reached, for the implementation of settlements. And this was actually the first time that um, a document adopted by uh, the Council, the European External Action Service and the Commission mentioned um, engagement with breakaway territories. And the previous sentence says, the EU would be ready to step up its involvement in formats where it is not yet represented, e.g. the OSCE Minsk Group in the, on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And this, again, is um, very concrete and also a new development. Um, the second group of policy documents um, are the European Security Strategy, which was adopted in... Um, in 2003 and which mentions the necessity for the EU to become more engaged and this was in, in conflict resolution. This was repeated then in the review of the European Security Strategy in 2008. And then there is a group of documents um, which evolved around the Göteborg program for the prevention of violent conflict. This program was adopted by the Council of the European Union in 2001 and there is a, there is a group of documents that, um, that were adopted in the years to come. So. If you look at the contents um, of these documents, <coughs> you can see a certain development from uh, the idea that democratic reform and economic development of the states um, affected by the countries, by, by the conflicts, would per se contribute to uh, conflict resolution. This is very much the core idea of the early uh, European neighborhood policy uh, documents to the acknowledgement that more concrete conflict related measures are necessary, including um, a policy towards and an engagement with the unrecognized territories. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about the development, the, uh, the development of uh, strategic thinking uh, in the European Union. And now 
I want to say a few words about implementation. I'm not going to go into any details. I think um, Peter was already very comprehensive about um, the EU and Georgia. Um, and perhaps we can discuss that uh, later if you're interested. I think what, what needs to be said is that the EU is pretty deeply involved uh, and engaged in um, Georgia and in conflict resolution there. Um, it, ha it was already engaged before the August 2008 war. It has um, obtained a very important position and, and role um, after the August war. There was engagement, there were contacts with uh, the unrecognized territories, and again, uh, Peter was um, very active in that uh, area as well. But of course, the situation has become much more difficult um, after the war. And it has developed uh, the non-recognition and engagement policy, which engages with, but, and I think that's, that's important to, to emphasize, it engages with, but it's not identical with uh, the Georgian strategy um, of engagement with the territories. Uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, the picture is very, very different. There's almost no EU uh, engagement. The EU has no, no role in the conflict resolution me mechanism and undertakes only very few projects that are conflict related in Armenia and, uh, and Azerbaijan and no projects at all um, with Nagorno-Karabakh. Not to my knowledge but we can discuss that later, okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and Transnistria, uh, again, we have a more active political involvement. What is very interesting in the Transnistrian case is that um, the EU has managed to sort of penetrate the conflict line uh, with, certain, um, with certain parts of its policy. Already since 2005, 2006, uh, Transnistrian companies uh, registered in Chisinau can export and trade with uh, EU member states, and they do. Mm -hmm. um, and cooperation under the European Neighbourhood Policy increasingly envisages measures and projects involving um, actors from both sides of the conflict line. So this is very unique and it's completely different from the situation in the South Caucasus. So what we see when we look at EU engagement uh, in, the, in the different conflicts is that they're diff very different, that the EU is engaged to different degrees and in different ways. But as I said before, um, this is not the result of a proactive strategic EU policy. It's more that the EU was pulled into uh, this engagement where it was possible, but it was kept outside the door where the conditions were, um, were not conducive. Um, and this is why I would like to speak a little bit more about these conditions and about obstacles that undermine um, a more strategic EU approach. Um, I think it is important here to, to look at the conflict level because um, the, the, whether or not the EU is able to become engaged very much depends on, for instance, the interests um, and also policies of uh, the affected governments. So are these governments actually interested in more EU involvement, or are they not? Um, it obviously, and, and also if, if they're interested, do they agree with the EU on the terms of engagement? And I think what Peter uh, said already pointed a little bit into the, in the direction that there were certain disagreements between um, the EU and the Georgian government on the terms of engagement with Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It also obviously depends on the willingness and the ability um, of the, the unrecognized territories um, to interact with the EU. And here again, we have very different situations in the different conflicts. Then I think the regional level is very important. Um, what is the perspective of other important regional actors? Russia, of course, Turkey, also partly the US. Do they want a more engaged EU? Is the EU able and willing to engage with them, to interact with them? Uh, on conflict resolution. And from an EU perspective, and this has also already been uh, touched upon, um, conflict resol resolution has often competed with other strategic objectives, mm. and relations with Russia are a very important factor here. So it's always also um, a question of whether member states agree that conflict resolution is actually conducive with their other strategic interests. 
And then, of course, um, there are the current issues of the EU, the internal level. Um, I mean, you, I'm sure you all know that the EU, that the, the Lisbon Treaty, which basically is the basis for the setup of the, of the um, European External Action Service, entered into force two years ago. The situation before the Lisbon Treaty was characterized by a disagreement among member states. Obviously, there was very little coherence um, in EU policy and particularly towards this region because of the Russian factor. Um, but also institutional fragmentation. Different institutional actors were in charge of different parts of EU policy and they were not always mm -hmm. coordinating in an optimal way. So the, the process of the emergence of EU foreign policy was extremely complicated and did not always lead to uh, optimal results. Now, people in Brussels like to speak about the post-Lisbon situation. Uh, I'm afraid we have not yet reached the post-Lisbon situation. The EU is still in a very complicated transitional um, period, a transi transitional situation. Um, and it is very much inward looking because of this institutional transition. And I think it will take another, I don't know how many years, I hope not too many, uh, to see if the external action service can really provide uh, solutions to these problems. And of course, the economic crisis and the problems that come along with it do not really help in that um, situation. Now, let me conclude. So I think what has become clear is that there is more awareness in the institutions which execute uh, EU foreign policy of the need to have both dimensions in conflict resolution policy. So the focus on the affected states, obviously, um, and conflict resolution through them, but also engagement with the unrecognized territories. But the EU remains weak on the implementation side. And I think this is something that we see very, we can very well see with, uh, with the non-recognition and engagement policy, which is there as an idea, it has penetrated EU discourses. Um, it is mentioned in EU, EU documents, but there's very, very little implementation on the ground. Um, like sorry? Like <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, as I said before, the, the external action service, the, the new EU foreign service has the potential to bring more conver convergence to EU policy, but it remains to be, to, to be seen if it manages to really bring together the, the different um, aspects and, and parts of uh, um, EU policy and conflict resolution in this region. And um, to, to, to end on a, on a rather forward-looking uh, note, what should be done besides the already existing uh, political involvement of the EU in the different conflicts? Um, I think in the case of Georgia, um, it is very important to continue the political, the political involvement, the polit political engagement, but it's, um, it's equally important to really implement the non-recognition and engagement policy, to put flesh to the bone, to the bone of this idea, um, and to de-isolate the territories, because this is the precondition for everything, anything else. Um, in Nagorno-Karabakh, I think, uh, the EU needs much more targeted confidence-building measures involving uh, Armenian and, and Azer Azerbaijani societies and gradually also involving uh, the society in Nagorno-Karabakh and also the, the, the unrecognized, the, the political institutions. Um, in the medium term, I think it is a good idea <coughs> for the EU to take on um, a role in the Minsk group but I think, first of all, now, in the short term, a, um, a focus on confidence building measures and conflict transformation is important. Um, with respect to Transnistria, um, the EU needs to find, more inf find incentives for more and more involvement of Transnistrian uh, societal, political, economic actors in the implementation of the European neighborhood policy and flank this with confidence building measures. Um, this is something which is foreseen, it's only starting to be implemented, but I think the findings of um, Gerard's uh, research project really show that confidence building is a very important aspect of the work on uh, the, the Transnistrian um, conflict. And in the medium and long term, and this um, basically links to what Peter said about 
um, uh, um, shadow policy of rapprochement with the EU, this could become a model for um, the EU's policy in the South Caucasus uh, towards Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and perhaps also towards Nagorno-Karabakh. But there, I think the situation is still much more complicated, and therefore the, the focus should really be on de-isolation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sabine. And, and thank you also for giving us some insights into the internal dimensions of EU policy. We sometimes treat the EU as a unified, engaged actor, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should all know better than that. So that's, that's, that, that, that's really helpful. Okay. Let's take some questions now for our panelists. So uh, please, again, uh, line up or speak into the microphone and uh, let us know who you are um, and who your question is directed to. Thanks, Corey Welch, George Washington University. I have a question about the WTO agreement, probably mm. for the ambassador, although I invite other panelists' comments as well. If you had asked me a few weeks ago if Russia and Georgia would successfully conclude this agreement, I would have emphatically said no, unfortunately. I was very pleasantly shocked that the agreement was concluded. So my first question is, why did the Georgians go through with this? The second question is, why do you think the Russians went through with it? And the third question, which harkens back to Tom's mention of Ergnetti, is, is this really the beginning of the legalization of trade via Abkhazia and South Ossetia, or would you caution us not to be very optimistic? Uh, let's actually take that one on its own, because I think it's a very important issue that we also discussed earlier, and get a response on that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm never surprised by Tom DeWall. Ethnic cleansing is called today in caveats. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And Shamba uh, was the Russian preferred candidate? Come on. And you don't see the differences between uh, Cyprus and Georgia? But it's on the side there. WTO is a very, very interesting um, case. And um, I'll just reflect my personal uh, feelings about it. From the very beginning, government of Georgia stated very clearly that we want Russia in WTO. And there's a very simple reason why we want Russia in WTO, because we want Russia to play by the internationally accepted rules, included in trade. So that was our position from the very beginning. Now, the question was how we are going to reach agreement with Russia on WTO that will not compromise our national interests, but will allow them to kind of uh, mechanize, I don't know you want to call it face saving or whatever, uh, um, with the recent developments uh, in the region. Uh, I think that the formul formulation that was finally found uh, and uh, accepted by Russians um, was a very pragmatic step from the Russian side because uh, eventually they came into kind of situation when the rest of the world was saying, no, okay. I mean, there is a document. You have, if you are serious about WTO, then take it. If not, then you know, leave us alone and go and create your own Eurasian whatever union. What are the opportunities? Uh, I mean, theoretically, there are many opportunities. We were never under um, illusion that lifting w, you know, membership of the WTO will lift the Russia's sanctions, uh, economic sanctions on Georgia. I mean, you have uh, Cuba and the United States uh, in the same organizations, but sanctions are still there. So these sanctions are pretty much political. So uh, somebody like Onishenko will find uh, yet another type of poison in Borjomi or in Georgian wines if it needs, he needs to. So that's not about that. That's about having Russia playing the by international rules. Now, it will have any implications for uh, Abkhazia and South Society occupied territories. I hope it will. Uh, so far, I'm not very optimistic because Ergnetti idea, actually, you can read in our uh, strategy document and action plan. And we were always in favor of the trade. And uh, we even uh, advocated for creation of the special economic zones that this trade would be happening. Or what Tom said, I mean, legalizing kind of um, uh, Ergnetti kind of exercise, as I mentioned in my presentation, that. It's an important uh, area of our interaction, so people should interact. What we are seeing now is that uh, the regime of crossing administrative boundary lines uh, are more uh, strict than they used to be. What we've seen that, um, you know, 
Uh, next, uh, almost the next day that we signed this uh, treaty with Russia, Medvedev went and sort of kind of signed some kind of uh, you know, customs treaty with these uh, occupied territories, and things like that. Um, so it, it remains to be seen. I, I'm hopeful that it will work, and I am very confident that you know economic relations can be a solution. Great, thank you. Let's take now a batch of questions for, for the panel. Let's start with Lincoln. My name is Lincoln Mitchell with the uh, Harriman Institute here at Columbia. Um, I want to go on record as making a promise that if we invite you back, all of you, 20 years from now for the 40th, uh, <laughs> we will not use the word frozen conflict <laughs> the title, but we'll have, a, we'll have a contest beforehand so we can pick their favorite term. Because, um, but actually, I'm asking a question about the second half of our title, which is 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Because it seems to me, and I'm interested in all of your thoughts on this, that it is relevant that 20 years have passed. Now, not, these conflicts have not been stagnant for 20 years, but they have existed for 20 years. Um, I hope they don't exist for another 20 more, but they certainly could. And as time goes by, things change. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I certainly appreciate that the, the legitimacy of, for example, Abkhazia as any aspiration of statehood um, must be uh, must be very, very strongly questioned because of its foundations in ethnic cleansing. But I wonder, and I, and I think that's right, but I all, we also know that we never recognize states based on ethnic cleansing until we do. And we have many, many states around the world that after enough time went by, they were, they, they were ethnically cleansed, time went by, and they were recognized. Um, that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing. I mean, we, we know, many, you know, um, uh, and, and many of us are, have, you know, we're, we're new, that's an unfortunate thing, but it's reality. But that's just one example, right? People st going back to somewhere starts taking on either bizarre mythic proportions or just becomes something that people move on from, whether we're talking about Nagorno-Karabakh or, or, or anywhere else. Um, <laughs> states, uh, states continue to find these unresolved issues um, very difficult for their, uh, to, to move forward as a state for, for really serious and important reasons. So I'm just wondering. I don't really want you to predict what the next 20 years is going to be. I don't think you can do that. I wouldn't, I mean, it'd be interesting on, over the break or something. But, but on a more serious kind of a perspective, what does it mean about the passage of time? How does that, how does that change the conflict? Right. Um, that's very open-ended, so any of you who want. Great. Th thank you, Lincoln. Uh, Sergey. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all panelists for terrific work and express my special gratitude to Ambassador Yukabashvili first and foremost for great attention to my modest person, and secondly for some historical discoveries. Till uh, today it seemed to me that the Russian Empire had died in 1918. As for Russian Federation, I'm not sure that its collapse would be great benefit for European Union, United States, Georgia, by the way. But now let me turn to the questions. Uh, the first question is addressed to uh, two ambassadors, Yugabashvili and Semnebe. It uh, would concern a uh, non-recognition engagement project. How are you going to combine occupied territory terminology and interaction with de facto states leaders who are not considering identifying themselves like occupied territories? What's the price? Not price, but price like a what? Are you going to propose to Abkhazia and South Ossetia? You could uh, ignore their existence, but they, they exist, maybe due to evil will of Russia. How are you going to combine two approaches within one? Uh, my second question uh, would be addressed to Ambassador Ikabashvili. I understand that Russia is the most important reason, prerequisites for, prerequisite for all troubles, problems of Georgia, but um, can you uh, recognize in maybe little extent, responsibility of Georgia for escalation of the conflicts in the early 90s, 2008. I visited Georgia three times in 2008. I was heard many, many words about repetition of Serbia and Ukraine, president in South Ossetia and so on. How do you estimate the situation? Thank you. Thank you. Now let's take one more and then we'll come back to you for a second round. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Inga Snip, Uppsala University. Um, I have um, a question for Peter Semnevi and uh, two questions for Temur. Um, first of all, uh, my question regarding um, the um, 
it's not as much as it's it's um, not about what EU is doing right now, but as you were talking about the aftermath of the 2008 war, and mostly about the 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 the, the peace talks that were going on. Uh, the EU went to Moscow and uh, discussed several issues, came back with a, a document that was being agreed upon by both parties. My question is, why did the EU allow only Russian peacekeepers in the areas since Russia was an active actor and a not neutral actor uh, in the conflict? Um, I understand that, I mean, things have to be weighed down and, and you didn't want the, 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 the conflict to like expand even more, but the EU must have known that um, this could have had disastrous results as we see right now. And then um, my question toward Temur, or my first question is, the neutral documents, I think they're great. It's an amazing plan. I'm, I'm very happy that they're there. My only question about them is, aren't you 12 years late? 12 years ago, this was proposed by Russia. Okay, let, by let's, yeah, let's keep it at that, yeah. And then my second question is, um, you just argue that you want to have trade with Russia, and um, you blame Russia for not accepting your products, which I think is a fair, fair blame. On the other hand, Saakashvili just mentioned a few months ago that he didn't want to hear about anything uh, Russia when it relates to wine. What is your response to that? Why does Saakashvili not want to interact with Russia uh, on wine export? Well, it be, would be very good for, for Georgia. Thank you. Okay, great. So why don't we go in the order of the table here, and we'll end with the ambassador. Um, we'll start with uh, Peter here. Well, <clears throat> there are conflicts that have lasted in, in a uh, uh, stagnant state uh, of affairs uh, for almost four decades at least. Cyprus would be the case that, mm -hmm. that, that comes to mind Im Im yeah. immediately. Uh, uh, some people would argue that uh, with the passage of time uh, that uh, the uh, de facto situation on, on the ground will become legitimized and, and um, uh, will evolve in, into a, a uh, final solution of, of the country. I think Cyprus demonstrates that uh, that kind of assumption uh, can definitely not be taken for granted. Um, we also have the experience of the of um, the war, as I mentioned, in 2008 in, in, in Georgia, which demonstrates that a situation that may seem relatively stable on the surface may contain uh, cracks and tensions uh, that will become very difficult to handle. So I, I, I would warn against uh, leaning back uh, and uh, just assuming that the conflict the conflict will be forgotten or, uh, or, or, or solve itself. Um, uh, we need to make, make further efforts. Uh, it would be tragic if uh, the conflicts were still there in their unresolved state in, in, and a huge failure of the international community if, if they would remain in their unresolved uh, state in, in 20 years from now. Um, Non-recognition and engagement policy, how combine this with the occupied territory terminology? The non-recognition and engagement policy um, uh, does not uh, uh, go be beyond the fact that it's very clear on, on the non-recognition and, and makes that a uh, condition uh, uh, for moving forward with the engagement, uh, it, it does not engage in any. It, it does not involve any further labeling of um, uh, of things, and I, I I don't really see any problem uh, in, in in this sense. Uh, uh, there was um, a question also about why the EU evolved Russian peacekeepers. I'm not sure I really understand the question. Um, we don't uh, have any Russian peacekeepers in uh, Georgia, including Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia after uh, 2008. We had, uh, for a very limited period uh, after the ceasefire agreement uh, was signed, um, uh, Russian troops, before they had had time to withdraw, fulfilling temporary security measures as they were labeled in the uh, uh, six point uh, in, 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 in the 
uh, not in the six-point plan, but in the in the um, uh, further agreement that was uh, reached in early uh, uh, September. But this was really only a temporary measure, uh, and they were indeed uh, withdrawn beyond the uh, uh, to, uh, boundaries of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. As, uh, 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 but be, be, the, the, the further Russian troops uh, that are present in Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia are not peacekeepers. They are not recognized as such. They are uh, in the interpretation of the European Union and the in, in international community there uh, in violation of the uh, ceasefire uh, agreements. What was reached in August and September in 2008, what was, uh, what was possible? Uh, uh, one may, of course, speculate whether um, uh, 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 um, uh, whether any further guarantees for uh, um, an international, or whether any further uh, international presence in uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia would have been uh, possible. I don't think uh, uh, there was any possibility for recognizing uh, and acknowledging that in the documents uh, uh, at the time. Um, uh, the EU and the international community continue to uh, insist that the European Union monitors uh, should have access to Abkhazia and, uh, uh, and, and South Ossetia, while Russia argues that this is not part of the, the agreements. And I think the, this uh, uh, situation will continue for some time. Great, thanks. Tom? <laughs> Thank you. On Lincoln's question, I think the only one which I could answer. Um, 20 years' time, I think the difference will be the new generation is, is going to be a different generation. Um, is this generation kind of, I would say it's neither better nor worse than the outgoing generation, but there are clear differences. One, I, I would say less Russian influenced. Um, on the negative side, that means that there's um, less Russian language around, which is, um, I think, going to be a, actually a difficult issue between Armenians and Azeris and, and Georgians um, and Abkhaz, I think, are increasingly not even speaking the same language. I think that's going to be a problem. Um, but that also means the um, elites, I think, less uh, influenced by, by Russia. Um, um, I see that uh, on my recent visit to Armenia. I, I, I feel a, a, a kind of a growing estrangement from Russia um, in Armenia um, amongst people. Um, I think it's interesting that the new Armenian ambassador to Washington, Elin Solomonov, and the new, uh, sorry, new Azerbaijani, excuse me, did I say Armenian? The Azerbaijani ambassador to Washington, Elin Solomonov, and the new Armenian presidential chief of staff, um, Vigen Sarkisyan, are both graduates of the Fletcher School. Um, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they have kind of pure US values, but they're, they're a different generation with a, a, a kind of professional uh, foreign training. And that encourages me in the sense that I think hopefully this next generation eventually will have more of a kind of strategic vision about their own countries, which will involve some kind of rapprochement. Um, to other conflicts, examples from other conflicts, Northern Ireland, where I think a generational change suddenly a new generation suddenly decided that they were tired of the conflict and that these paramilitaries no longer served their interests. And, and, and Cyprus, I'd be interested to hear Timuri ex to explain to me why um, Cyprus is so different. Um, I see many more parallels than differences. Um, um, Cyprus, you know, let's not forget in, 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 in 2004, the Turkish Cypriots voted for reunion with the South. And I think that for me, again, is, 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 is a good illustration of how a kind of soft power and engagement policy, a much gentler policy with them, um, bore some kind of fruit. Um, unfortunately, it was the South that resisted, and, 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 um, and, but I think you know, Cyprus is, is at least, it's still stuck, but it's much riper for peaceful transformation than, than the South Caucasus conflict. So. Yeah, thanks, Sabine. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Lincoln's question. Well, I mean, if you look at the, and I'll, I'll apply that to, to the subject of my presentation, if you look at the past 20 years, I think 
it's incredible how the EU has changed as an actor in the region and how it has substantially changed its relations with, uh, the, with its eastern neighbors. I think it is really incredible. Um, and this process is ongoing. Uh, the EU is now uh, negotiating association agreements with all six, uh, five, sorry, <laughs> eastern neighbors. Um, it is going to start to negotiate uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with the South Caucasian states um, very soon, December or January. Um, so this is an ongoing process and it has changed the region, it has changed the EU. Um, so far it has not been really conducive to conflict resolution and I think this is exactly the tricky point. This is where the EU has to find solutions in the upcoming 20 years. Um, and very briefly, in addition to what Peter said to Sergei's question uh, regarding the, the the combination of the terminology of occupied territories and engagement. Um, I think from an EU point of view, and this is what I tried to make clear in my presentation, is it is important that EU, the EU idea of non-recognition engagement policy can be su supportive, of course, of uh, Georgian engagement with um, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but it needs to remain distinct. And I think that uh, the, the Georgian side should, this, should see this rather as a potential than as a threat because if the EU really succeeds in or works on de-isolation and succeeds in that in the, in the medium and long term, this is only in, in Georgia's interest. But I think it is really important to keep these two policies uh, separate. Great. Ambassador. Uh, where to start? I think that I'll start from the security. I think that um, without offering to Abkhaz or Ossetian security guarantees, anything you guys are talking about doesn't make any sense, sorry. Because uh, uh, they can be making their independent decisions only after they will have a alternative security guarantees than Russian troops there. In that sense, I think it's very, very important to push their, not Georgian tanks or Georgian police, but international peacekeepers or international policing mission, and we should start it by allowing UMM to fulfill its mandate fully, okay? Only then we can talk about independent decision making uh, on these territories. Otherwise, when, un unless the security is not addressed, there is no such a thing as the conducting opinion polls under the Russian tanks or things like that. Um, and it's doable, I think, absolutely. And I think the EU is already engaged there, much more than it used to be. It has an observer mission, quite significant number of people, and they have to be given opportunity to fulfill their mandate. As for uh, differences between Cyprus, I, I don't know if Georgians have any other country. I know that there are Greek, Greece, and there is a Greek Cyprus, and there is Turkey, and there is a Turkish Cyprus. I think that Cyprus is a member of the European Union and Georgia is not. I think that it was uh, the senior German advisor who uh, Peter was referring to, uh, who was asked by us, uh, would he ever see the unification of Germany without Germany being part of NATO? He said, absolutely not. Let us be part of EU and NATO. And I think then we will be more trustful for, towards you know, greater kinds of engagements. Uh, I think the congratulation of the Cyprus leader was, as a Northern Cyprus leader, was as a pretext of the UN um, brokered uh, and unfortunately failed uh, attempts of unified Cyprus. And uh, again, the idea was not to have an independent uh, Northern Cyprus, but to have a, some kind of federation. And I can go on and on. Uh, as for the, my excessive interest to Sergei Markidonov, uh, you were the one who was uh, mostly mutilating and um, uh, facts and uh, preparing in into uh, presenting them into the uh, to be very diplomatic uh, um, in uh, inaccurate way. Okay. Uh, and that was uh, why uh, I was sort of referred to that. And so for Russian Empire, yes, I think there is a Russian Empire with Nagorno-Karabakh uh, excluded probably, but Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and the rest of Russian Federation, it's, for, for me it is a kind of Russian Empire. So there is nothing big and surprising there. As for 20 years, 
Uh, I honestly don't have a crystal ball. And I have no idea about how tarot cards work. But as all of us pretend to have ability to predict future, uh, my prediction will be that uh, there will be a different geopolitics in 20 years. And we, like or not, we have to differentiate two issues from each other. And I think both of issues were reflected in this panel and previous panels as well. Geopolitical games and local developments. So in local developments, as I mentioned, I think we have to be for engagement. I mean, David Phillips produced the very interesting documents about how to foster the trade. Yeah, neutral because it has a certain neighborhood. Can Georgia replicate Switzerland? I mean, we have a nice mountains too. And probably not because it's not about us, it's about our neighborhood. Uh, is it 20 years late? Russians have a saying that it's uh, better late than never. Uh, 20, 12 years ago, I was not a minister. I could not <laughs> invent any travel documents. And uh, I think it's never late to have a humanocentric strategy. It's never late to address needs of people in a practical sense. Would it make more sense 12 years ago? Probably yes. I think that uh, if we would be more serious on this kind of issues 12 years ago, we would have um, you know, different realities on the ground as well. Um, Again, there was a different leadership 12 years ago on um, uh, uh, two times the escalations and um, uh, you know and differences that now these territories are officially called occupied. Escalation, yes, there was a lot of uh, escalation talks. I remember all of them uh, because I became minister in the beginning of 2008, and I remember everything the Russian government was saying. And I remember how the Russian government was not crossing red light uh, lines, but was uh, dividing the red lines into pink lines and crossing one by one, testing the Western reaction. Um, it's not only you who was uh, in Georgia, but I was you know, on the 7th of August in Tsinvali, seeking for Kokoiti to talk to him. I was there, and I remember very well what happened. Uh, we can go into debates what, who started, what started. I mean, things are very clear. And Medvedev saying what he said indicates very clearly what happened and why it happened. Uh, we only can be grateful to Russian leadership who is finally revealing the real reasons of war. Uh, and as for wine, uh, you know, that's a very funny situation. I, t I talked to Georgian wine industry trying to lure them into U.S and to increase the wine sell in the US. And I discovered something very interesting. Um, for most of Georgians who have the wine business, it's a secondary business. It's not a primary business. You know, I have, I don't know, the auto industry, uh, I don't know, banks, and I'm a Georgian, I should have a wine as well, okay? Second problem is that there is not that much wine that you can sell. And we made a calculation, if Georgian tourism will develop as we plan it, there will be no wine for export. <laughs> it will be all consumed domestically. <laughs> and third, when you talk to winemakers, they don't like Russian market. And the reason they don't like Russian market is unpredictable. And Moldovan case is very, very illustrative in that case because Imagine that you have to invest in the labels uh, and you produce the wine. It's not something that you can produce immediately. It takes time, right? So you produce for Russian market, the Russian labeled um, you know, bottles, and suddenly somebody, Onishenko, decided that it's poison. And uh, I, I, don't, I lost the control how many times the Moldovan wine was allowed and then banned again you know, within the one year period of time. So these are, we are talking about businesses. The businesses don't like unpredictability. It's like markets, you know? The, for markets, it's easier to know, know what is a default. For them, it will be easy to see Greek defaulting because we know what is default, and markets know what is default. There are a number of countries who defaulted, and, you know, they're doing okay. Same Russia defaulted, as I remember, and they're doing okay financially now. So it's not uh, a, a sort of horrible story. So markets and the businessmen do not like unpredictable uh, situation, and from that point of view, 
Russian market is not attractive. Okay. So a combination of these three, it's, it has nothing to do with politics at all. Uh, it's purely economic dimension of it. And, uh, you know, since we are concluding, I uh, again... We'll, we'll, we'll have one more, one more round to conclude. If, ah, if you okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Let's take... Um, these are the last three questions very quickly, and then we'll okay. wrap up. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Helena, and my question is... What's your institutional affiliation? Uh, GS, senior, graduating this year. Professor Thank you. Professor Snyder's what student. What is GS? General, uh, general Studies. Um, general what? The question is for Tom Deval and for uh, Madame Fisher, and in that light for also uh, Georgian Ambassador, Ambassador Yakubashvili. Um, we spoke about the issues of using soft power a lot today, and particularly just now, you mentioned the issue of language, and this is precisely why I'm here and why I want to ask my question. Um, how do you see Georgian side using its soft power by possibly bringing in South Ossetian, let's say, student, South Ossetian students to Tbilisi to educate them in Tbilisi. If on the ground in South Ossetia, it is a known fact that recently Russian language was declared by de facto authorities as a national language and over official, thank you, thank you, official language, and oh, I didn't write my questions down. So, and in Abkhazia, over a number of years, there were absolutely medieval ways. C can of I ask you, fighting, please, to be brief fighting, with the question of, of at fighting, this point? Uh, of fighting uh, Georgian language and burning of Georgian books in Suhumi University. That's one thing. And another thing, and being Professor Snyder's student, I have to ask this question, uh, this question as to, um, it is a known fact that conflict is to great extent a very personal conflict right now. And how um, uh, you and uh, Madame Fisher and maybe um, Georgian Ambassador Yakobashvili see uh, the role of fiery rhetoric on behalf of current leaders as a major con contributing factor to this conflict being stalled. And I want to assure you, I am Georgian, my mother is Russian, and I'm married to a Greek Cypriot. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. So, okay, conflict and language and fiery rhetoric, please, please, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just have a comment, so. Please be brief. Uh, I'm addressing you to Thomas Deval, so. Who I are you, first? My name is Maryam Rusishvili, I'm from Georgia. And Please speak um, into the microphone, you're being My paid. name is Maryam Rusishvili, I'm from Georgia originally, and I'm a recent graduate from SIPA, Colombia. I did PAPM program, Program in Economic Policy Management. Uh, thank you all for your valuable insights. And I'm, I just wanted to say that I agree with you, Mr. Val, that we should stop like uh, searching for the parental advice and blaming on the external powers. But it's also true that we can't strip off the geopolitical uh, factors. So the only tool that is left with Georgia is left with is uh, diplomacy. And it unfortunately it doesn't really work against uh, power politics. And another thing is about the similarities between. I'm sorry, I, I have to cut you off on the comments. Just a small thing. thing. About the Cyprus, Cyprus and. Very uh, quick. Okay, quickly. I mean, we know that the uh, conflicts are different in nature, otherwise they could have been the part of the case law. And accordingly, it could have been applied to all the, case, all the conflicts. So okay. the, um, most of them are regarded as the sui generis or the unique cases. So I mean, I, I, I couldn't follow him. That's why I wanted just to comment. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And uh, Gerard. Um, yes, I wanted to follow up on a point that Sabine had made about the politicization of um, um, the, this issue and the difficulties of academic research um, as a consequence and to try to get from uh, Ambassador Yakubashvili some clarification on the position of the Georgian government about academic research in these uh, very contested areas. Um, from, I can just to give you my own experience, um, having traveled to Abkhazia and also to South Ossetia, uh, to see the massive destruction with your own eyes 
and we can uh, get some sense of that, is absolutely uh, vital to uh, grasping the issues. Um, yet it is, it's unclear about whether conducting research there is uh, in violation of some of the laws that are on the books in Georgia. So it would be very helpful to get some kind of uh, clarification on that. Thanks yeah. very much. Very good. Thank you. So I'll ask the panelists to answer in two minutes each, uh, and then we will wrap up. Uh, Peter. Oh, there was no question really addressed to me in this uh, batch, but let me just uh, comment uh, very briefly on what Timuri said about security. I absolutely agree uh, that uh, uh, you agree with me? That, uh, that, uh, that security is uh, an, an absolutely crucial uh, precondition for a, a solution of the uh, conflict. But what I also mentioned uh, in, in my presentation is that we cannot obviously limit uh, our uh, uh, involvement uh, to security. In that case, we, we will uh, refreeze uh, uh, the situation with very detrimental uh, 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 consequences. Um, I did, in fact, already before the war talk with uh, uh, people on both sides of the administrative boundaries on, on the security issues, and, and I must say that uh, based on the, uh, my talks at the time uh, and, and the, the um, uh, responses that I got uh, and, 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 and the, the, the mindset that uh, existed at, uh, at the time and that I still think exists, uh, I do see uh, possibilities uh, in the future, perhaps not immediately, but, but uh, in, in the future of finding solutions that are uh, mutually, mutually acceptable. If we deal with the primary concerns of the parties <coughs> uh, uh, in, involved, that is the security issues and uh, uh, the, the um, uh, engagement, uh, the, 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 the need to be part of a larger context and the IDP refugee uh, issues, uh, we will have gotten a, uh, come, come a long way. Not forgetting obviously about the interstate aspect of the, of, of, of the conflict as well. Great, thank you Peter. Tom. Thank you. Yes, on fiery rhetoric, I've said that the, on record as saying, and I'll say it again here, that the Nagorno-Karabakh dispute needs a, a rhetoric ceasefire before it needs anything else. I think words are definitely part of the problem in that conflict, um, above all others. Um, but then there is also, again, I repeat the issue, what language are people going to be speaking to, to one another? And I think that issue has to be addressed. And, 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 and I think... It's unfortunate the Russian language has been, is in many, in Caucasus now being associated with the Russian state. I think, with, I think um, you know, we, know, we don't associate the English language with, um, the, with England, and I don't think we should associate the Russian language with, with Russia. I think it's a, a useful tool of communication um, in the Caucasus, and I think it should be maintained um, as, a, as the Russian language. Um, Geopolitics, yes, I agree. Um, these context, uh, conflicts obviously have a geopolitical dimension and a local dimension. Um, but um, I think you know, we should work on the local dimension if possible, or, you, or the locals should. And the geopolitics may, may, may change. Um, I, I think Russia has multiple interests and in changing uh, priorities. Um, and it's often forgotten that, for example, Russia in the 90s have pretty much heavily sealed the border with Abkhazia and enforced sanctions. And Primakov um, was very heavily twisting the Abkhaz in, in 97 to do a deal with Tbilisi. Obviously, the situation is completely different now. But I think that's an illustration that, that Russia doesn't have permanent uh, policy towards this region. It has changing interests. They may change again. And so that's, uh, I think, an argument for working on the local realities and hopeful that the geopolitics may, may change. Um, all conflicts are, of course, unique, but all conflicts are also conflicts. And I think um, um, so there is a certain conflict dynamic to all conflicts, uh, given that all conflicts are unique. I think that's, that's all I'm going to say on that issue. Finally, I predict that um, in distinct, 
um, contrasted Timuri, um, my our mutual friend in Washington, Mamuka Teritelli, makes this prediction, and I share it, that the um, after all elections are gone, Russian wine will be um, Georgian wine will be back on the on the Georgian um, excuse me Georgian wine will be back on the Russian market. I, I don't believe you can separate a Russian lady from her kinsmarauli. Okay. And then Sabine has <laughs> ceded her time to the reception. Uh, Ambassador, you get the final word on the panel. Uh, you know, it's rather strange, actually, why Russians like the semi-sweet wine and the rest of the world uh, dry. And it's uh, one of the mysteries about Russia that I have. But Russians uh, like women. Yeah. I, I don't know. I cannot comment it. I'm a married man. Uh, um, um, on the language, I'll tell you the anecdotic story, which is actually the real story from my personal life, because um, I saw my son, who is 19, uh, reading book, and I was happy that he was reading book, and it was not in the internet. And I said, what are you reading? You know, I took the book, and it was, um, you know, Russian author. It was Nabokov. And I was quite pleasantly surprised, but I said, uh, oh, well, you are reading Nabokov, that's great, but you know, the book is in... English, and he's perfect in Russian. He said, yes, but I don't like to read in Russian. Uh, that's a very worrying signal, not only for me, but you know, for an uh, entire generation, that um, the policy of Russian Federation toward the Caucasus is pushing the new generation away, not only from uh, Russian state, but from Russian language as well. Uh, and we may still read in the Russian authors, but not in original languages. And it's not good, I think it's not good, but uh, it's nothing to do with us. It's what are the choices given to us by Russians. And second thing is what you hear in Russia. If you speak Russian, what is that you are getting in Russian language? Uh, that's horrible. If you watch the Russian TV, uh, that's just horrible. Uh, I know that you have a luxury to watch the Russia Today TV, which we call Parasha Today TV. But um, you can watch Canal Pig. Uh, the Canal Pig, actually, I, uh, I don't have time to watch it, but I, I like it in the sense that it's not an anti-Russian channel. That's very important. Uh, it's a pro-regional, and I think we have to help that kind of TV stations. And uh, uh, from that sense, I think that it, it very much is related to soft power. And Russians missed every single opportunity to use their soft power in the region. And it's very pity. From Georgian perspective, the South Ossetian direction was completely in last, uh, I don't know, uh, three years before war, was a completely soft power story. We spent millions of dollars in South Ossetia in soft power building schools, build, be, building uh, swimming pools, building uh, playgrounds, building discotheques, and building God knows what not. As a soft power tools that, you know, if we are together, you know, we don't mean any harm, we don't mean any war, we mean a cooperation, which was brutally destroyed by the Russian forces. And the first thing that they were attacking were actually those infrastructure that were built by us in the last three years. So soft power has its limitations when it is confronting the hard power. But again, it's still a tool that should be, nevertheless, I believe, utilized. On academic research, uh, I have to admit I am the one who is advocating to lift uh, whatever is on you because you entered the, um, from the north, because I think that academicians should be given opportunity to study whatever they want to study. Uh, Polling is a little bit different, you know? You are polling on ethnically cleansed areas and asking questions, and I want to see those Mingrelians who say that they are not Georgians. We have Kachetians, we have, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, Swans and others, very distinct people who are very strongly keeping their um, regional identities, but none of them say they are not Georgians. So in that sense, this separation uh, in this kind of, it's like calling that I am from the specific region of Tbilisi and the further fragmentation kind of things. Um, 
What was the other question? I think that's it. I think it's uh, almost all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, very last thing I want to say before going, uh, I have to go, is that um, these academic exercises are always helpful, at, at least to refresh your memories and to see what are the opportunities. Uh, what I learned in America is it's okay to be wrong. So when I hear the wrong ideas around table, I'm not as obsessed as I used to be. But, you know, I understand that people can be wrong. It's, it's okay. Uh, we can argue. And these kind of venues are actually giving these opportunities to argue. And it's good. Uh, we may not change our opinions, but at least you are aware that there is alternative opinion on your arguments as well. And I again want to uh, underline that the solutions lie in more interaction. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And that brings me to my final comments, which will be extremely brief. I'm not going to summarize uh, today's events. There's a New York sunset going on a Friday evening and a reception outside. Uh, but I want to exactly pick up on this point. And uh, you know, first of all, thank you to everyone who has traveled to be here. This is really met, and I think surpassed our expectations in terms of the level of dialogue I think has been very high and, and, and let's do this again soon and let's welcome you back again soon. Uh, these issues are difficult but here at Hammond we're in the business of doing difficult issues. We're not interested in putting conferences on easy issues or uh, platitudes or statements or so forth. We want to tackle that and we have the luxury because of Cold War reasons of being able to do that. And, 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 and hold these types of events. And so you're all certainly welcome here. And a special thanks to Ambassador Yakubishvili um, for uh, remaining engaged uh, throughout the day uh, and also um, for really uh, providing the policymakers and analysts perspectives. Because with our ideas that we sort of share here at Hammond and academic conferences, if we're going to venture in the policy world, then we also have a responsibility to engage with policymakers and allow them uh, uh, opportunities and also to question our methods, our assumptions, uh, you know, our practical limitations and all things. And, and I hope this two-way dialogue uh, will continue. So having said that, uh, we hope to welcome you again soon for a Not the Frozen Conflicts panel. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming, for participating on a Friday. And please enjoy the reception outside and the rest of your day. Thank you.